say that, and um, I just need a bit of advice, really. I split up with my boyfriend about three months ago. He's been sending me a lot of messages, even though I've asked him not to contact me. I know that he's hacked into my Facebook and also my phone. Basically, like, just messaging my friend tonight. He's, well, I had a knock at my door. Still a bit, like, shaken up. What I call it. Please, I've just I've just come back to my flat and the door was locked, so I crawled through the window and my flatmate's covered in blood in the bathroom. Alice! Alice! Oh my god, she's dead! She's dead! Police have launched a murder investigation after the body of a Leicestershire woman was discovered in Gateshead. Officers found 24-year-old Alice Ruggles with serious injuries on Rawlings Road last night. She died at the scene. A murder was an act of utter barbarism. Her throat slit from ear to ear in her Gateshead home. You look at that bathroom and you think about the injuries she'd sustained. Five or six times the knife had been drawn across her throat. It was so brutal and senseless. She was a kind-hearted young woman who had everything to live for. I first met Alice when she was at uni here. This is actually a picture taken on the first night that Alice and I met and that cemented our friendship. It's the kiss of true love right there. This is a video of Alice doing his signature dance move. We used to joke that we, like, won the dance floor. A night out with Alice would be very entertaining. She had such a lovely, bubbly energy about her, and we were just fast friends straight away. This is us drunk in the bathroom, pulling funny faces. <laughs> she brought the je ne sais quoi to whatever was happening. <laughs> when? when? <laughs> Alice was the third of our four children. She always had a joke or a story, something that would make you laugh. And, and she had this tremendous sense of fun and of mischief. When she finished her degree, she wanted to stay in Newcastle. So she spent a year, 18 months, I think it was, working in, in bars. And, and then she got a, a job with Sky. Go, Alice! I think... Alice's life really started in that sort of year. She'd ring me up and say, oh, Mum, it's amazing. I've got to organise the Sky Christmas board. They're all going to arrive and they're all going to have cocktails. And it seemed almost as if everything she'd been doing before then had been a sort of practice. And now, suddenly, she's doing what she wanted to do and really enjoying it. This photo I took on the day that I asked Alice to come to Sri Lanka with me. We'd never been outside of Europe. We wanted new experiences, and it was nice to be able to do that together. We shared quite a lot on social media because obviously we wanted everyone to be as excited as we were, or even just like a little bit jealous. On our way to Sri Lanka, we sat next to somebody that found Alice very attractive. I posted the selfie to Facebook. A friend of a friend actually commented 
on the photo. And that person was Harry. Harry was in the army. He had been at the same university as me. He was a very good friend of a good friend of mine. She thought that he was very nice, very caring. Harry did send me a message a few days later. She went straight to Facebook to see what he looked like. She actually started messaging Harry when we were in Sri Lanka. He seemed to be being very nice to her, saying all of the right things. It seemed to be making her really, really happy. She was always looking for someone that could match her level of love and caring and affection, and she'd basically hit off with him straight away. She said they'd had an instant connection. Within the space of a month, it was a solid, I love you, you love me, we're together, we're going to be together forever sort of thing. We had FaceTimed, like, hundreds of times at this point, but they hadn't physically met. It's a completely different world for me to feel that you're in a relationship with someone and you've only met them on social media. He was a soldier and he was actually out in Afghanistan on tour at the time. But they just communicated a lot. And she started sending him things. She just said, you know, I've met this person and I and I think he might be a really good person and it's it's quite interesting and I'm enjoying it. I didn't realise that they never actually met each other at that point. A 25-year-old man's been arrested on suspicion of murder and remains in police custody. Are you saying that Alice is dead? Or someone's... All, all, all I can tell you is that you've been arrested on suspicion of the murder of Alice Ruggles. The first time they ever met each other, they spent like two solid weeks together. He stayed in Newcastle for a week with Alice at her flat. He spoiled her silly during that time. He bought lots of things. They went out places. And then he went back to Afghanistan to complete his tour for a couple of months. Then he came back for good. He lived in barracks just south of Edinburgh. Two and a half hour journey down to Gateshead, where Alice lived. They were technically long distance, but I don't think that impacted so much. She said to us, it's the most she'd ever felt for anyone. She was completely head over heels, and he reciprocated that, and that made her feel really special. He was everything Alice wanted him to be. And she said to me, Mum, I think he's the one. There were obviously a couple of wobbly issues. If things are going that fast, it doesn't necessarily seem out of sorts that there would be a teething issue at some point. We just assumed that it's just very clumsy and of course he would never do this on purpose. I wasn't seriously worried. I assumed that there would be common ground found and they would work through it. But Alice was very choice with what she shared and with whom. I don't think anybody actually knew the full story. We got like all of the juicy gossip at the start and then it petered off and we didn't hear loads. We would arrange casual meetups and she'd brain check on and she was just a little harder to get hold of. 
I just kind of pinned it on a new relationship being something that does take up a lot of your time at the start anyway. Alice took steps to withdraw from all of her friendships. It was very difficult. I thought of Alice like a little sister. To see somebody completely become a shell of exactly who you know them to be, I think was pretty devastating. I highly suspected that Harry had a lot to do with that. It was really a little bit later before we started to realise, hang on a minute, things aren't right. He demanded to know where she was going and, and, and what she was doing. Unannounced, he'd just drive down to Newcastle and turn up. What he was actually doing was gradually isolating Alice and making her more and more dependent on him. We just didn't realise the danger that she was in. So, Harriet, 1834 hours yesterday, Alice Ruggles was found at her home address in Gates and she'd been murdered. Mm -hmm. okay, did you murder Alice? No, I did not murder Alice. have launched a murder investigation after the body of a Leicestershire woman was discovered in Gateshead. Officers found 24-year-old Alice Ruggles with serious injuries on Rawlings Road last night. She died at the scene. A 25-year-old man remains in police custody. So, Harriet, 1834 hours yesterday, Alice Ruggles was found um, at her home address in Gateshead and she'd been murdered. Mm -hmm. okay, did you murder Alice? No, I did not murder Alice. Do you have any knowledge of this? No, I don't have any knowledge of this. Were you present when this murder occurred? No, I wasn't. We used to have a family holiday to Cornwall every year. <laughs> it was quite a nice excuse for everyone to get together, especially considering we're normally remote and everyone's in different places. That year, Alice invited Harry. And I thought, oh, OK, it must be quite serious if she's bringing him along. Alice was a little less outgoing than she'd normally be, I think. She was a bit less... a bit less Alice. She was less self-confident. She'd lost weight. She had this sort of faraway look. It was quite clear there was something seriously wrong. But we couldn't talk to her about it because he was always there. Just a couple of days after they went back up from Cornwall, Alice was contacted by someone she didn't know to say, do you realise your boyfriend's cheating on you? All through this time, he was actually dating other women on other social media. When she discovered that he'd been cheating on her, that was when she ended the relationship. Or tried to, because, of course, he wasn't going to have any of that. I thought it was a very extreme breakup based on what she shared, but I think she 
made the decision that she needed to fully move on from this relationship. In the background, Harry was unleashing the most awful strain of harassment. Please call me back, please. I just want to speak to you, there's nothing else. I don't even know if you're getting this away from this, but please, can you call me back? If he couldn't get a hold of her, he would drive down. He inserted himself physically into her life. He's messaging her any way he can, from his friends' mobile phones. He sent the message to me, and he sent messages to some of Alice's other friends. And I just messaged him, and I said, if things are really going so badly, then maybe it's better that you don't carry on going out. And then I put at the bottom, good luck, Harry, meaning go away and get on with your life. I have a horrible feeling he took that good luck, Harry, to mean carry on. She's tried telling him she's not interested. That hasn't worked. He's escalated, he's continued the behaviour, and it's got worse. So I think at this point she starts trying to ignore him, and that's when it starts to get a bit more serious. I'm a tech guy, I'm from a tech background, so my first instinct, of course, right, well, he's got access to accounts and devices, we need to get that back, we need to lock him out. The problem with these big social media companies is you're not really talking to a person and they can't really help you for a lot of these things. In the end, she closed that Facebook account and started a new one. And that's not necessarily the best way to go about it. If you factory reset devices and reset all the accounts, you gain back that control, but you can cause the perpetrator to escalate further. It's something that I did I shouldn't have done, but because um, I had a Facebook password, so um, I went on her Facebook and changed her password. So you've logged on as her and changed her password? And, yeah. yeah. Obviously, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say I don't stalk her and all that. But obviously, I did look at her Facebook to see what's going on because I've been with her for so long through all these things, so I can't just turn her off my head. Alice went and stayed with her sister, who lived in Germany at the time, for a weekend, which was really lovely because it just took her away from everything. She was telling me that she was having the best time, there was a guy that she was interested in. She also joked that, thank God, because she actually didn't know if she was capable of that again. Alice didn't really share that on any public social media but she did talk to us about it over WhatsApp. She was being cautious because she didn't know how Harry would respond when he found out about it. Harry found out about it quite quickly. I suspect he was reading the WhatsApp messages the whole time. So Alice is left in a position where her ex is weaponising her social life. She doesn't know how to stop him. She doesn't fully know what he's got access to. She couldn't hide anything from him. Every waking minute, he was right, what's the next thing I need to do? How do I do this? I'm not a mobile geek. 
I couldn't go on her Facebook or on her, on her um, WhatsApp. I couldn't hack her phone. But I just played that card out like, well, I've got on your phone and I can see there's a guy you're speaking to. Tell me what his name is. Tell me what's going on. She fell for it. And she was like, oh, I met this guy. Um, and I was like, uh, please don't do this to me. How can you move on so fast? I'm still in love with you and you're like, you've moved on. Hi there, um, I just need a bit of advice really, um, more than anything. Um, so I split up with my boyfriend about three months ago. Um, since then, I, I know that he's hacked into my Facebook and also my phone. He's been sending me a lot of messages even though I've asked him not to contact me. And then tonight he's, um, well I had a knock at my door there was no one there and then it happened again two or three times. He's come round the back, knocked on my bedroom window at the back of my flat, the ground floor flat and he's been outside and he, he's like left some flowers and chocolates on the like outside window sill and like he walked off, he's not done anything but I'm just, I'm concerned. Like my friends have been telling me to call the police, I've been right. putting that off but it, I just feel a bit like shaken up tonight so. Well it can be fast. Harassment. Yeah. Which is a crime. The guy at the end of the phone, he identifies it as harassment, not as stalking. And there's a serious difference there. The fact that he is prepared to spend five hours just to come down on the off chance of, of seeing her gives you an idea of how dangerous this situation is getting. Hey, Alice. After we spoke and we didn't want to speak, so I, that's why I decided to come down and just give you flowers and chocolates. I just wanted to give you flowers and chocolates to prove that, no, I don't want to kill you. I'm not, I'm not intending to kill you. That's all I wanted to say. He's telling her how he would never kill her, but why would you talk about that if you were not trying to frighten someone? You've had no indication that Alice wanted anything to do with you ever again. Yeah. Yeah, you've still come down. Yeah. And it's not like you live in Newcastle. No, I know. I've come down. You, know, you live yes. over two hours yes. away. I understand. So that, to me, makes me think this guy is, like, desperate. You are desperate to speak to her. Yeah. yeah. Alice, once she had made that phone call, to 101. The best practice would be to get an SPO issued, a stalking protection order, which would protect her, but also manage Harry Dillon's behaviour. Unfortunately, this time they weren't in place and a pin was issued. She believed the police and the pin would be that full stop. She was told on the first call that if he contacted her again, he would be in breach of his pin and he would be arrested. We didn't really understand that he was obsessed with Alice and how dangerous a person it was. And after she'd gone to the police and Harry found out she'd gone to the police, he messaged me again. He was absolutely furiously angry. It really, really disturbed me at the time. And then she also received a parcel with a really weird letter. Dangerous stalkers often only reveal themselves when it is made absolutely clear that you are the wrong side of the law. A significant number of people will step back at that point. But for other people, it will be the sparking point of absolute control. I have nothing to lose. Harry took that course of action. I think that once Alice called the police, that was when he decided he was going to kill her.
Alice was taken away from her family by an obsessed man who was so controlling he chose to brutally murder her rather than let her go. Alice has done all the right things. She's contacted the police, she's moving on, she expects him to move on, and you know, the protection should have been there, but they weren't. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I've been in touch with the police. Somebody's been issued with a pen so that they, they can't contact me. However, I've had a had a letter off them. Uh, what was the content of the letter? Was he so pictures of me and him? Um, like because uh, he's my ex-boyfriend, so like a, a notebook that I sent him when we were together, and a letter. It says at the bottom he won't contact. You know, this will be the last I hear from him. But he's, he's said that a lot of times, and. It, he, he never does seem to stop. So, so you want to call back and discuss this? She was phoned back by the police, and all we know is Alice was so upset by this because they and phone say, "Well, what do you expect us to do about it? Arrest him?" In a in a tone of voice that made it sound completely ridiculous to want that. I just can't even comprehend the level of despair someone has to be at because they essentially knew, given the last interaction with the police, that they, they were on their own. There was no help for them. Alice rang me and said, they're not going to do anything, Mama. Nothing's going to happen. And I said to well, Alice, just ignore him and he'll go away. Well, and of course, that's the most ridiculous advice ever, and I know that now, but I didn't know that at the time. It doesn't really matter, though, because the police should never have asked her what she wanted to do. They should have said, this guy sounds dangerous, we are going to arrest him, or at least we're going to go and talk to him, um, because their job should have been to keep Alice safe. It had been delayed a bit at work. It was going to be another half hour, an hour getting home. So Alice gets to the flat, locks herself in, as always. She was organising meeting up with this new guy. She was very excited about it. Suddenly, she stops responding to anything. A flatmate gets home and she can't get in through the door. So she has to go round climbing through a window which has been left open. She finds Alice. Police emergency. Thank you. Go ahead, call us. Please, I've just, I've just come back to my flat and the door was locked, so I crawled through the window and my flatmate's covered in blood in the bathroom. Is she breathing? I don't know, I can't, I can't look, I'm sorry. Okay, try, try and stay calm. Alice. 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 Oh my God, she's dead, she's dead. Can you have a look and see if she's breathing for the ambulance? She's not. She's not. She's not breathing. No, she looks. No. Everything to not look. It looks like she's been attacked. Please help. Oh, my God. I can't even go on. I'm so scared. I'm so scared. Try and stay calm. You're doing really well. She's not breathing. She's actually blue. Please. Please, I need to come to here right now. I know you do. We're getting to you as soon as we can. She's only 23. I mean, you're this is coming. I, 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 she's an absolute psychopath. 
Say that again, sorry. Uh, she put on a complaint on about her ex and she wrote 101 at the weekend to the report that she started in contact and says we're going to do nothing now. This has happened to me. About you? Her ex-boyfriend, Harry Dillon. I woke up first and I could hear this knocking at the door and the dog barking. Of course, get to the front door and there's two police there asking if they can come in. You know it's something horrible and the question in your mind at that stage is simply, which of them is it? Who is it? As soon as they said it was Alice, then we kind of knew immediately who'd done it. We dismissed it as being... We were overreacting and then suddenly this was really happening and... It's sort of, you can't believe, you can't believe it that it's, it's happened. Officers found 24-year-old Alice Ruggles with serious injuries on Rawlings Road last night. She died at the scene. The 25-year-old man's been arrested on suspicion of murder and remains in police custody. So Harriet, 18.34 hours yesterday, Alice Ruggles was found um, at her home address in Gateshead and she'd been murdered. Mm -hmm. Okay, did you murder Alice? No, I did not murder Alice. Do you have any knowledge of this? No, I don't have any knowledge of this. I think he genuinely believed that he would get away with it. Can you tell me what you were doing yesterday then from 10 a.m. until the time you were arrested last night? I drove down towards Newcastle and because I was I, I just I just wanted answers so I, I drove down to speak to her so you've knocked on the door and there's been no reply no did reply. you go back to the car no or did you go straight round the back straight round the back I jumped over the, the wall so you've jumped over yeah and so I've jumped, jumped over and she then started saying um, what, what are you doing here I'm going to call the police leave now and I'm like Alice please calm down Stop panicking. I'm just here to speak to you. You've not given me my answers. I just want my answers. Yeah. She's like, I'm going to call 999. I'm like, OK, I'm leaving. I don't want it. I don't want any trouble with the police again. I'm leaving. I found out at about 4 in the morning. I mean, immediately, I knew it was Harry. Although, obviously, nothing's been proven or anything yet. We're looking for fingerprints. We're looking for blood transfer from the scene to the car. See, the thing is, sorry, I'm in trouble. Go there on. won't be any blood transfer because there was no blood on me when I left that place. So are you saying when you left her, she had no injuries or anything? Oh, no, no, absolutely nothing. No injuries, nothing. She was perfectly fine, fit, healthy. We've been told exactly what happened to her and how you, you, cut her throat. No comment. Are you looking back? Oh, yeah? No Do you comment. remember what happened? No comment. Do you remember what you did? No comment. Do you remember how bad it was? No comment. Do you remember the blood spraying? No comment. I'm, I'm being told that she suffered. She must have known what was happening. Because she didn't die straight away. <laughs> Harry made the choice to <clears throat> drive two and a half hours um, and end Alice's life. Um, and then pretend like it never happened. Um, that is what happened. A man has appeared in court accused of murdering a woman from Leicestershire. 25-year-old Triman Dillon, also known as Harry Dillon from Scotland, appeared in front of magistrates at Newcastle Crown Court this morning. But a case like this one, where you think the evidence is overwhelming, everybody expects the person to be convicted. I was very surprised at the first hearing when he said he was not guilty of murdering Alice. Tonight, a soldier accused of killing his ex-girlfriend at her home in Gateshead today described the events leading up to her death. Lance Corporal Tremaine Dillon told jurors at Newcastle Crown Court he went to retrieve clothes from the home of Alice Ruggles, but after a prolonged scuffle, she fell and was wounded in the neck by a knife. 
he denies murdering her. I didn't think there could be anything more hurtful that could come out of this. I'd lost Alice, and that was horrific. But Dylan had put in this counterclaim that Alice had tried to murder him. It's really difficult to think this was that person we met to someone who is clearly an evil person. He spent two days standing just five metres in front of us in the courtroom, spinning his story. He was totally unemotional. He'd keep putting nasty words into Alice's mouth as he was describing his version of what happened. That I really hadn't been prepared for. That was really, you know, uh, a hyper level of nastiness. He used the opportunity to undermine, devalue, discredit anything that he possibly could. I think Harry thought that we were essentially just all puppets that he could play with during that trial. As a prosecutor, you don't know what a jury will make of it. So you've really just got to break it down and not take any chances. The background and the atmosphere that was leading up to this killing was so important. Over many, many weeks and months, there'd been this campaign of telephone calls. Oh, please call me back, please. Text messages, WhatsApp messages, Facebook messages. A heaping on pressure on pressure on pressure. Prosecutor Richard Wright QC accused Lance Corporal Harry Dillon of stalking his ex-girlfriend Alice and being utterly obsessed with her. It was a very important theme in the evidence that he had a real history of controlling behaviour. It was a feature of not just his relationship with Alice, but of all of the relationships we were able to identify. We learned lots of things during the trial that we, we, we didn't know before. For example, there were two or three occasions when he'd stalked other people. We'd had some inkling of one of them, but, yeah, not, not the others. He told Alice about the restraining order against him, and, in fact, he used that as a sort of weapon for Alice and said, there's no point in you calling the police because I've done this before and I got off with it. The prosecution suggested Dylan is a person who lies to help himself. Dylan accepted he has lied in the past. We were able to really break it down and demonstrate to the jury that what he was doing was lying, and every time a lie was disproved, he'd come up with another one to, to tell in its place. The scenes of crime analysis demonstrated that the slitting of the throat and bruising to Alice's back suggested clearly was that Dylan had kneeled or stood on her back, pulled back her hair and slit her throat in the shower. So the idea that she was the one with the knife was ludicrous. You want the jury to get there themselves. You've got to give them the tools to make the decision. Alice Ruggles wanted to live because she loved life, and that image of Alice is what I wanted the jury to remember, not what he did to her. Her murder was an act of utter barbarism. The words of a judge today as he jailed a soldier for killing his ex-girlfriend at her flat in Gateshead. The judge formed the view that Harry Dillon was an obsessive, controlling narcissist who would show no remorse at all and gave him 22 years as a minimum term uh, of a life sentence. Alice was a kind, incredibly sociable, fun-loving person. She had the ability to light up the room whenever she walked in. We miss her so much. There wasn't enough understanding about stalking laws and there wasn't enough training within the police about stalking. The police should have been able to identify 
that this was a stalking case, what was going on, and have known what they should have done. The IOPC, the Independent Office for Police Conduct, found that Northumbria police officers did not properly investigate Alice Ruggles' concerns about stalking. His use of social media isolated Alice from support and limited her ability to prevent unwanted contact. I think there's a thousand and one lessons. Everybody needs to know what stalking is and, and how dangerous it can be. I think people need to be able to spot things like gaslighting and love bombing and controlling behaviour. We also need to learn that it's not just the person who's being stalked who needs the attention. We need to think about what is it that we can actually do to these people who are stalking. By no means will everybody who harasses somebody go on to kill them. But people who kill their partners in domestic contexts will often have harassed them. And so one is a warning sign of what might happen. The criminal justice system will always be the blunt instrument at the end of the process. That What needs to change is at the front end in terms of protective measures that can be put in place before you get to court in terms of the police taking these issues seriously and in terms of having the resources and the tools to tackle this sort of behaviour. If we think half of all stalking cases are about relationships or intimate connections that have come to an end, those relationships will have very most likely come from a relationship that was coercive and controlling, that then becomes stalking at the point of separation. So if we can educate people more about both recognising control when it's happening to you and recognise when you're being controlling of others, then we stand a better chance of reducing the rate of stalking in the future. The Alice Struggles Trust, for example, are very committed to education from a young age about healthy relationships. We founded the trust in Alice's name because we thought, no, we've got to stop people like ourselves not knowing how dangerous stalking is. We wanted to prevent what happened to Alice happening to others. Social media has changed stalking in that all cases of stalking will now have a cyber aspect. We can be more exposed because of our social media accounts. We can be researched in a way that wasn't possible before. The cyber age has given us so many other ways in which people can be stalked. There are various, really quite worrying surveillance tools out there. We have to be acutely aware of those. The purpose of the trust is to raise awareness, to do training, to try and to, to change the problems that we found. I think there's more public understanding now than there was in 2016. There are more safeguards in place but there's always more to do. I think a lot of stalking victims feel like they're overreacting and they need to not worry about it, but I think that's the way the stalker wants you to feel, and actually they need to feel like it is serious and that people are there to help them. What happened with Alice? It was tragic. It shouldn't have happened. She did a lot to to try and make sure that it didn't, but it just goes to show that you need every cog in the system working, and it's a big system. <laughs> Alice will always be a gaping hole in my life and a gaping hole in my children's life. I want to remember Alice as the lovely, happy, funny, wonderful person that she was. I don't want to remember that she was murdered. I wish is that people would see her more as a human rather than a victim. She is a human first and she was my friend first before she was Alice Ruggles. <laughs>